Hello, and welcome to the Folklore and Fiction Podcast. My name is Kelly McCath Morin. I'm a PhD candidate in the Folklore Department at Memorial University of Newfoundland, and I'm also a speculative fiction writer under the pseudonym C.S. McCath. The Folklore and Fiction Podcast and Dispatch synthesize these passions with a focus on folklore scholarship aimed at storytellers. You'll find the Folklore and Fiction archive along with the rest of my work online at folkloreandfiction.com. Interested listeners will find a link to the current dispatch in the show notes, where a more comprehensive record of this episode can be found, including a bibliography and other references. This episode of the Folklore and Fiction podcast was first published as a newsletter in April 2020. I'm recording it as a supplemental podcast now so that new listeners and subscribers have an opportunity to engage with the material. In it, I'm discussing curses, with help from scholars Natalie Underberg, Evangelos Abdikos, and others, outlining the use of curses in storytelling and providing you with an example and a reflective writing exercise. If you're new to the podcast or missed March 2020's What is a Charm edition, do go back and check it out before engaging with this one. Many folklore scholars agree that curses may be viewed as negative charms, and with that in mind, this discussion is an extension of the last one. Folkloric Discussion of Curses Like charms, curses are expressions of folk belief and verbal lore. Moreover, Jonathan Roper's definition of charms also works for their negative counterparts. They are patterned traditional utterances performed in specific contexts, they're sometimes accompanied by gestures and accessories, and they're credited with the power to bring about changes in the health, fortune, safety, and emotional state of an individual or group. With these similarities on board, we can begin to look at curses a bit more closely. Natalie Underberg identifies and discusses several curse motifs in folklore and literature, including curses that result in the creation of outcasts, like Cain, the ancient narrator, and Sweeney, pagan king of the ancient Pictish kingdom of Dalriada. Cursing competitions that require feats of verbal dexterity, like the ancient Germanic flighting, and the Irish cursing matches popular in the early days of Christianity. Maledictions delivered by holy men or women, like St. Ronan, who cursed Sweeney with madness for obstructing his efforts to establish a church in Dalriada. Ritualized curses delivered by poets in ancient Ireland, whose words were believed to be uniquely powerful. And maledictions grouped into those intended to cause physical harm, bad luck, misfortune for the recipient's descendants, or death. Underberg also writes that, quote, Generally, a form of sympathetic magic underlies many rituals associated with cursing. Imitative magic works according to the principle of a like produces like. A voodoo doll is a good example. Contagious magic, on the other hand, operates on the idea that something that once was in contact with a person will continue to exert control over him or her even after it has been removed. End quote. But what interested me most while researching this newsletter was the argument Underberg and Evangelos Abdikos both make about the power imbalance that exists between the cursor and the accursed. Underberg writes that there is an inverse relationship between a group's social power and the proliferation of its cursing traditions, while Abdikos discusses this issue at some length in his work on Carpathian curses. Specifically, he approaches them as, quote, counter-hegemonic devices, end quote, that seek to address social asymmetries in the community. Put simply, people place curses because they feel powerless, are aggrieved in some way, or believe a wrong needs to be righted. A few Carpathian curses. It occurs to me that I've written two newsletters about verbal lore and haven't offered any examples from folklore. So here are a few Carpathian curses found in Abdikos' work. Invocations of God as the Ultimate Authority May you be paid back by God. May God wither and roast you. Ever since he fell on earth's track, he's been my enemy and been fighting against me. May God oust him from it. Before God, you'll be arraigned, and from him may you find it and not lose it. Abdikos writes that in cases where a cursor calls upon God for justice, it is often because she feels too weak. This episode of the Folklore and Fiction podcast is a preview, and you can listen to the full episode on the Folklore and Fiction website. 
Just click on the dispatch link in the show notes or go to folkloreandfiction.com and sign up for a free account. Thanks very much for your interest. Copyright 2019 to 2023. Kelly S. McCath Morin. All rights reserved unless Creative Commons licensing is specifically applied.